leftovers haven't always had a good reputation. I remember the first time that I had to make my recitation in a school assembly. It was centered around a turkey dinner somehow. And I was given this, this poem to read about the turkey. And, and each stanza started with, well, the first stanza was about dad. He paid for the turkey and worked for it and brought it home. And, and uh, the guests, in the house, they got a good slice of the turkey and, and how the older siblings, they got a leg and, and then, but after each, they all got their healthy portion, but after each stanza and after each segment, there comes this one line again and again, but I got the neck. Leftovers, not exactly high priority, Usually the morsels that stay in the fridge in many cases until you have no choice but to throw them out. Except maybe when you have a four-legged pet, especially a dog who sits there on the floor at the feet of the high chair waiting for Junior to pitch some food overboard that he doesn't like accidentally or not accidentally, and the dog is right there waiting for it to pick it up. He likes them. But we're finding out even dogs aren't so really supposed to be into leftovers. They have to have these special diets. One for the growing puppy, the one for the one with fur issues, the middle-aged puppy and the senior dog, they all need their refined, specialized, menued dog food. Leftovers are out. Now this morning we find out that leftovers are in. And we sometimes experience that. I certainly experience that. Somehow leftovers, when someone says, we're having leftovers today for lunch, I mean, my, my attention perks up because from last night, probably it gained some taste as things marinated and mixed a little bit and, and warmed up. It really tastes pretty good for a lunch. The reading this morning we have and we meet a woman who desperately pleads for the leftovers, for the crumbs. So much so that she realizes her very daughter's life depended on it. Now as you read this, and you probably felt this too as you read this brief little passage, there's some very startling things about this. Even difficult things. Some of the comments that Jesus makes, for instance. So let's get into this a little bit. About the dog food, about the crumbs, and why she wants them. One of the first things that brings to my attention right away is it, it describes her as a Canaanite woman. Now, if you're thinking a little bit historically, that's a rather strange identification or a label to make because there were no Canaanites in those days anymore. This is New Testament. But Matthew's deliberate designation here points out something. It strongly contrasts this Canaanite, or really Gentile, woman to the bona fide, certified, authentic child of Israel. The one to whom God does relate. And the one for whom Christ did come into the world. Where she was more like the dog that lives from the scraps that happened to fall from the table. She was just a Gentile. 
didn't count. And yet, from the mouth of this woman comes this very unusual way of addressing Jesus. She says, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, where did she ever get that title for Jesus? I mean, folks in Jesus' own circles hadn't even called him that. They're just getting used to them, who he is. Even, even the disciples hadn't really spoken of him so much as the Messiah, recognizing him that way. But here she is, this Canaanite, this Gentile from another country, miles ahead of all the rest, in understanding who Jesus is. And her effort to look him up in view of her daughter's demon possession underscores her sense of awareness of who he is. But this woman isn't the only one who catches us off guard. Jesus does. In fact, before I knew what was going on here, Jesus kind of embarrassed me. Because when this alien woman addresses him, he doesn't, he doesn't at first even acknowledge her presence. He totally ignores her. Doesn't say a thing. In spite of the significant way in which she addresses him. Well, that's kind of impolite, if not outrightly rude. And, and then the disciples immediately see her also as this undesirable nuisance and encourages Christ simply to send her away, get her out of here. And then to add insult to injury, Jesus says, I was sent only for the lost sheep of Israel. All right then. Is he suggesting he'll have nothing to do with her? And then, to make things even worse, he says, it's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. It's one thing to be called a dog. But he's saying even more than that. He's saying, is he not that I'm not here for the likes of you, lady? You don't belong in the circle? And it's only when she persists, doggedly refusing to release her grip on his heels, that Jesus says, all right then, you've got great faith, your request is granted. So interestingly, when Jesus puts up all sorts of obstacles, she maintains her tenacious grip on the claim of the crumbs and the compassion of Christ until he relents. Is that the Jesus you heard about in Sunday school? I've came to know him as wanting to include everybody with determined compassion. And here we find out the only one who has determined compassion is this foreign woman. When our Lord puts up obstacles, she maintains her tenacious claim. She even goes so far as to go for the crumbs. Now, various attempts have been made to explain this, understandably. Some suggest that, ah, Jesus was just testing her. See where she was really at. Others that well, maybe Jesus himself wasn't even sure why he came into the world as yet. He was still trying to figure out his mission statement. And there are those who claim that, well, Jesus was trying to bring this person to the point of humiliation before him, before he would grant the request. But some, uh, somehow none of those worked for me. In fact, Jesus, I have to start with, he knew what he was doing here. And Matthew 
is, is really on target recording this incident. He knew what he was doing. What was happening was at this moment, there was this epiphany watershed incident. History would never be the same after this. God's love in Christ reaching a new stage. A major world transition was in the works. And the disciples were witnessing it. The audience that Matthew was writing to, Jews mostly, was witnessing it. And through this encounter with this Canaanite woman, Jesus is taking the disciples and the whole community of Israel to this new level, to this new era. And he does it by starting on their terms, walking with them, with their attitudes, with their perspectives, with their understandings, and walks them towards this new understanding. Now, the issue wouldn't fully be resolved for some time. There would be always those in the future who would hang on to the idea that God's love and care was reserved for the insiders. That only those who were bona fide, certified, belonging to Israel were included in God's covenant and God's community. And there would have to be several incidents like these along the way, even in the apostles' later years, to jolt the people of God into this new reality that Christ came for the world. So there's a lot happening here that a very determined woman of faith seeking the healing of her daughter is meaning. We're presented here with the very basis of being the people of God that comes to a new level. And it's not so much your external ethnic certification or authenticity. It's not a matter of what side of the religious tracks you were born on. Now it's the dog food. It's the dog food. It's, it's all involved with these crumbs that fall off the table that make the difference. The recognition of them and not letting go of them, but letting them represent your life. Because you see, this is all about finally Jesus, the bread of life. Folks had kind of been getting the impression that what was on the outside was going to get you into the kingdom. These external certified characteristics and practices that linked you to a particular people of God that the Lord had indeed used over the centuries, but precisely to bring his love into the world. But that was all changing now. And Jesus and Matthew, who records this, jolts them into a new reality. The crumbs would be the food on which he would build his community, reaching to the far ends of the earth. It would be a people of faith, not with some external characteristics necessarily but people of faith. I'm reminded of the little girl who thought she had exhausted mathematics when she was bragging to her grandpa that she learned up to 12 times 12. With a twinkle in his eye, he asked, well, what's 13 times 13? She turned to him in scorn and said, don't be silly, grandpa, there's no such thing. So you can see what Jesus was up against here. A whole new way of thinking 
that needed to transform into something much bigger than what people had, ima had imagined over the last number of centuries. The Canaanite had been the long-standing opponent and enemy of the people of God. And here Jesus grants a request of healing from her because she has faith in the crumbs that fall from the table. In fact, at this point, she sees even more than the disciples were catching on to. Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. Not even an authentic Israelite had picked up on that one. Oh, for some time still, people would still be saying, there is no such thing as a child of God outside of Israel. Well, today it's this Canaanite Gentile world that went for the dog food, that recognized him and chased him in pursuit at his heels that declare him as Savior. So are you going to go for the crumbs? Are you one of these followers of Jesus that he discovers in the world? Is that what attracts you to him? We come here to the very heart of the Christian message, actually. In we're faith, we receive the gift of God's love extended to the likes of us, residents of this world for which he came. But somehow, over a period of time, we kind of get into a rut. We get into these old patterns and we need, I need to read the story again. You know, there comes a point sometimes we've, we've reached certain external qualifications and certifications and in order to be part of this people of God. Or maybe you're protesting that, well, I don't have my life together yet enough to be part of this. Or maybe church has never been my thing. Or maybe a personal life history that makes you come to the conclusion that, yeah, I don't belong, I'm not part of this. Or maybe you simply feel you're beyond saving you are a hopeless Canaanite or Gentile. And down deep you've come to sense that somehow that you become somebody that you're not and that you have to become somebody that you're not in order to fit in. But then we've got her all wrong. Because this Canaanite woman, she was absolutely nothing in that culture. And that's the whole point. She was at the end of a rope with her daughter. She wasn't part of the in crowd at all. But she discovered that it was in receiving Christ, embracing the crumbs, the bread of life, that she became someone. And that she began to experience the healing of life. The first uh, chapter of the Gospel of John says it so well. To all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he became children of God. No one suggesting this woman had it all figured out and knew exactly what Jesus was up to all along the way. Her demon-possessed daughter was still a priority to get that cleared but our Lord uses this incident with this woman to stretch our thinking, to bring us into the new reality of Jesus Christ for the world and therefore Jesus Christ for me. So yes, there is, there is a world beyond 12 times 12. Grandpa was right. And there's only one way back to God that distinguishes Christianity from most others are all world religions. It's in the crumbs, the bread of life for you and me. A young man by the name of Bill 
did a world tour. His parents sent him on it to help him figure out his life, what he wanted to do with it. And at one point, he sat on the top floor of a restaurant overlooking Copacabana Beach in Rio de Janeiro. Then consider the jet-setting capital vacation place of the world. And while sitting there alone at a table in this restaurant, he overheard a couple, a retired couple in the next table over, chatting together and saying, you know, honey, it's been worth it. All these years working, making money, sacrificing and saving have brought us to this wonderful vacation and this enjoyable evening and this pleasurable life that we can now enjoy. Well, young Bill in his 20s heard that and he couldn't help but be overwhelmed by the absurdity of it. And he said, oh, there's got to be more to life than that. And indeed there was for him. Because from then on, he planned his life around the crumbs. Jesus Christ, the bread of life for the world. Let's pray. Lord, speak to us again today. Tell us who we are. Do what needs to be done to help us regain our identity in you. And to go for the crumbs, to go for the bread of life. Jesus Christ. Also now as we prepare to experience that presence and that grace, also in very visible and sensual ways in the sacrament. In Christ we pray, amen. I invite the...